The Cardiac Cougs get the 29-26 win against the San Diego State Aztecs this past weekend. They moved to 7-1 on the season and are now ranked 22 overall in the AP poll. They have a ton of work to do, but the positives is that they've shown that they are able to win games in multiple different ways, come back when it's needed, have big defensive plays. And a big plus from this week was that John Mateer took another step forward. He had four total touchdowns, two on the ground and two in the air. He had just over a 70% completion percentage on the day, no turnovers. And after this game, he set the single season record for a quarterback of Washington State, 575 rushing yards in a single season. Season. He is currently second among WCU quarterbacks in single season rushing touchdowns with 10 on the year. And after just his eighth career start, he is now third all time among WCU quarterbacks for total career rushing yards with 725. And after this week among all FBS players this year, he is now tied for fifth in total touchdowns with 24, fourth in total yards with 2,429, and tied for fourth among quarterbacks in rushing yards per game with 76.1 rushing yards per game. So let's get into this week's episode with Dylan Howe. But before we do, the sponsor of this podcast is Black Label Supplements. They are a third-party tested, athlete-approved supplement company based here in the Pacific Northwest. Make sure to check out blacklabelsupplements.com. Use discount code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. I'll put the link to their website in the description of this video. Grind, hustle, win, repeat. And as always, if you or somebody you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, make sure to reach out to myself, Connor Webb, the Couch GM, as I'm a full-time mortgage broker during the day when I'm not making these sports videos. And it's my goal to help as many sports fans and athletes get into the home of their dreams. If you'd like to get started on your home ownership journey, make sure to reach out. I'll put my contact information in the description of this video. And with that, let's get into the podcast. The Cardiac Cougs come through with a big win at San Diego State. 29-26 is the final score. After the game, Jake Dickert termed the team the Cardiac Cougs because of their heart, their drive, being able to come back. This is the third real come-from-behind win that they've had this year. But from my perspective and from other fans' perspectives, the Cardiac Cougs takes on a new meaning. Everyone do one of these because it seems like the, the team is really trying to make all of the fans go into cardiac arrest most of the time. It's like the most stressful games that you can have. Dylan, what was your saying? Who needs drugs when you've got the Cougs? I was saying that at uh, Saturday night and everybody was cracking up. But I mean, dude, what a what a uh, what a collapse! What a comeback! I mean, that game had a little bit of everything. Tariq Buda Luka saved the day. Uh, it was twenty six to twenty one. SDSU had been kind of hitting us with those RPO slants, and he said at post game, like, "Hey, we got together in the third quarter." We made the adjustment and he got the pick because they were getting ready to go up at least eight points. They were already in field goal range. The field goal kicker had already buried a couple field goals. So it, it just wasn't looking good. And then Mateer, his second game winning drive of the season. Obviously, you know, the San Jose State drive had some marbles in it, you know, less than 35 seconds and gets him down there for a field goal and Dean you know, blasts it through and then you know, he found Carlos Hernandez on the first touchdown, a second touchdown run where dirt was on the ball, gets in his eye. He breaks a tackle, breaks a tackle of Trey White as well, the leader in the nation in sacks and and hustles on down for 17 yards. And I mean, man, and then they get the touchdown and then you had the Philly fumble Ruski special where, you know, Hudson motions over, gets the ball, uh, you know, gets it to Williams. Williams fumbles it and throws it to uh Mateer in the end zone who said post game, that was his first catch in a game before. So some first for everything, but at the end of the day, the Cougs took care of business. They got the win on the road and that got them up to number 22 in the nation because, you know, we had a lot of uh, teams 20 through 25 lose last, last Saturday. Yeah, and at one point, San Diego State scored 20 unanswered points to get them up to 26 to 14. That was at 13:39 left to play, and then the Cougs mounted their comeback, a clutch comeback from from the entire team. You know, Matier. Let's just talk about the field conditions. You know, on that run that you mentioned, Matier after the after the game said that he saw that there was grass on the ball. The ball was snapped to him. There's grass in his face. He can't see. He just realizes he's getting tackled, so he's just books it and is able to be an athlete to, for those 17 yards to be able to extend the drive turns into the touchdowns you see the the fumble ruski from uh, chris hudson he gets the ball starts falling down and is able to get it off to Matier. what what is going on with that field 
It was horrible. It was a sand pit. And thanks to the correction there. Sorry, it was Hudson that threw the ball. But it, yeah, it was a sand pit. I mean, it, it looked like me uh, with my driver on the on the opening tee, just shanking. I need a little dirt, please. It was bad. And that's been a story. The San Diego Wave, the women's soccer team down here, has been complaining about the field conditions. You know, obviously the state players have to be not too keen on on playing on that field as their home games you also have a professional mls club starting up in 2025 early 2025 say that three times fast and and, and they're they're going to be wanting to bring in big name high salary players and soccer players are not going to play on that they're going to need to invest into this field other than that the stadium was fantastic the Cougs showed out and and it was just a fantastic experience and obviously we'll get into that but yeah, field conditions, horrible. Yeah, it looked like it. And, and you mentioned the uh, the Cougs traveled well. I saw the video that you sent, and I'll put it in this this podcast. But the the Cougs showed out from the the looks on TV from the angle of the camera. It looked like a lot of the student section or whatever's across the field from the camera section was was empty. So was the stadium just not very crowded? It wasn't very crowded. It was homecoming for San Diego State. The student section was in the north end zone for San Diego State, the show, as they call them. They showed up in the first half and they pulled the WSU student section and were gone in the second half. So, and, you know, the way the seating also, too, was set up was like on the, the Coug section was like 113 through 170. I should, it probably was like 110 through like 125. I mean, there was 15,000 Coug fans. In attendance. It was insane. Cougs outnumbered Aztecs. I mean, you just saw it walking to the stadium, getting into the stadium. There's Cougs everywhere. This is going to be a very fun road trip every other year for Cougar Nation to come down and get to San Diego. PB was Pacific Beach was filled with Cougs. You have Tap Room, which is a a, a Coug bar where the, the Coug Alumni Association has games every Saturday in San Diego. And I mean, it was just a it was an awesome experience. You're hearing go Cougs. I mean, it was loud. And and you can hear in Buddha Lukta's interception return how loud it was in that stadium. It was just an unreal uh, envir- environment to be in. I saw a lot of people. Uh, shout out Jeff O'Neill. He tweeted, hey, this was a top five, top 10 Cougar experience I've had attending a game. So like it, it was a lot of fun. And and after the game, the MTS trolley system was just filled with Cougs. It was it was like, when is this going to ever happen again? Well, I guess the next time they come down to San Diego. Yeah, and you could tell on the broadcast when San Diego State had the ball, it sounded like it was WCU that had the ball because of just how loud the crowd was trying to trying to get on them. And there's a ton of Cougs that are graduates from, from the California area, but it sounds like a lot of the, the people that were down there were from Washington. Yeah, I you know I was I was just chatting it up with a lot of folks that hey where did you guys fly in from oh yeah hey we're West Side um, you know Piala uh, you know it was it was all over the place so we had a great section and you know like we said you know I, I tweeted out something it was like that James Franco news uh, tweet where it's like first time it's like literally all we need to do is win and we're ranked so. You know, it, there were there were certainly some issues uh, that that came out of this game. San Diego State not a good offense at all, and they were able to do really whatever they wanted. You know, during that twenty point unanswered streak, and you know they came into the game uh, SDSU number one hundred six in total offense at three hundred and forty yards per game, uh, number one hundred five out of one thirty three in scoring offense twenty two point three. So. They came in averaging two, 213 uh, passing yards per game. They put up 340. They had 409 total yards. Um, so, yeah, there's there's some issues uh, with this WSU defense, and 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 the passing is is part of it. Uh, you know, they're 120th out of 133 in the nation in, in passing yards allowed at 270 per game. The sacks did come back again this week. They had four last week, three against San Diego State, and Ansel Dimba had had all three of them. He was he was fantastic at generating pressure and just kind of making things tough for Danny O'Neill when he was in the game. And and like we said, you know, in that Buda Alukta interception, that was only Danny O'Neill's second interception of the season. I think he came in with 10 touchdowns and one pick somewhere around that range. So he's not been turning the ball over for Sean Lewis and company. And we get another late turnover. I mean, the San Jose State game, the Fresno State game, and now the San Diego State game. If it's not for the turnover margins, this is a five and three team. 
And speaking of turnover margins, a big positive was that John Matier was perfect on the day. He did not have any fumbles lost. He did have a fumble, but it was not a lost fumble. He had four total touchdowns, two through the air, two on the ground. He finished 19 of 27, 257 yards in the air with those two touchdowns. That was a 70% completion uh, percentage. On the year, you know, before the Hawaii game, he was somewhere in the 50% range. So we've seen a, a good improvement over the past couple of weeks with John Matier. And actually after this game, he now has set a WCU single season record for quarterbacks with 575 rushing yards this season. He is currently second among all WCU single season quarterbacks in rushing touchdowns with 10. And he is now third all time among WCU quarterbacks for career rushing yards with 725 career rushing yards through just eight games started so far this year. So John Matier, he is showing out, and he has actually been selected as one of the, the candidates for the Davey O'Brien Quarterback of the Year Award. So make sure to go to Washington State University Football on Twitter, find that link, go vote for John Matier, and, and let's bring him into the next round. Yeah, Matier, I mean, he had a great performance, and he got – beat the hell up too in that game 21 carries 42 yards your quarterback has taken some licks and it's a very good thing that they have a bye week um this week so obviously utah state's going to come into town you know the following week and you know Matier said it after the game he said that last hit really hurt you know obviously you know you, you got to keep that guy healthy uh especially with kind of maybe what's going on with the backup quarterback situation of wanting to get Zevi a, a red shirt and, and give him an opportunity maybe somewhere else next year. So yeah, it, you know, Matier, he is what he is this season. He is an athlete playing quarterback. You know, obviously the progressions are still an issue. The Carlos Hernandez touchdown luckily was the first, it felt like the first time all game if the first progression wasn't open. It wasn't happening. And he finally looked off that first progression and got back to Hernandez and, and, uh, you know, obviously got that, that big time touchdown to, to get us within five points. So, you know, a lot of, you know, I, I said something about the progressions and in, in my mature criticism this year, obviously wouldn't be where we're at without him. There's obviously some, some headaches that go along with it, but that's, you know, Hey, he's starting his ninth career game in a, in, in two weeks. So, you know, the big thing is that, hey, some people said, hey, the whole idea is let's get him into the offseason, season, find the right quarterback guru, start layering throws, getting better touch on that deep ball. Because, you know, he missed a deep ball to Kyle Williams in, in that first half. You know, Wazoo Jubu, Jobu tweeted the other day, you know, we really waste Kyle Williams. He's really good. Kyle Williams is a phenomenal wide receiver. He had five receptions for 74 yards. Carlos Hernandez finished with uh, four receptions for 65 yards. He had the San Diego hometown kid, Josh Meredith, Meredith with two big receptions for 44 yards. So that was a nice little homecoming for Josh. You know, our buckle seemed over his, in over his head at times in the third quarter. There were some, some drives that left you scratching your head, some quick three and outs where you're going, oh man, here we go again. You know, luckily, hey, they got the job done and now you have your, your cakewalk schedule you know, up until the Oregon State road game, you got to take take care of business at home against Utah State, and then you have New Mexico, which which could be a tricky game. Bronco Mendenhall is a pretty good coach, but I think right now the issue with New Mexico is the Jimmy and Joes, not the X's and O's. And we'll see how that how that goes later on in the season. One thing that the Cougs need to improve are the third down and fourth down efficiencies. In this game, they were five for twelve on third downs, fourth downs they were one for three. But kind of going back to your comment about Matier in this offseason, I think the perfect candidate for someone to team up with him this offseason is going to be Cam Ward, who is now at the University of Miami, one of the Heisman front runners. After the game, Matier was talking about that last run that he had, and he said that he pulled out his inner Cam Ward to break out of, of those tackles and rush for 17 yards. So those two team up this offseason, he could take it to the next level. And again, this is just this was his eighth career starting game in, in college. Next year is going to be a, a lot of fun to see. Getting into some of the, you know, I'm curious on the behind the scenes with this. You shared the video of it today, but Jake Dickert and Janikowski, you know, at the very end of the game, Dean Janikowski punts the ball away. The the guy attack runs into him. He falls over. It's a personal foul. The the, the Cougs get the ball, and then he starts to get in the guy's face and starts to, to stand up for himself, and then Dickert goes off on him on the sidelines. He did apologize after the game saying that, 
he should have had a flag thrown on himself too for how he reacted to Dean. But uh, you know, what are you? What's your take on that? You know, at the time in the stands with a couple brewskis in me, I was like, "Let's go, Dean! Love to see that." And then, kind of the panic set in, like, "Uh oh, like, are we gonna have to what punt that this mean? ball again?" Yeah. yeah. Luckily, we didn't have to punt the ball again because Dean barely got that off too. And the other aspect too, I think, I think why Dean was was maybe so pissed off is like he's their only kicker right now. The kickoff specialist is hurt. Harborer's been hurt. They're talking about redshirting him. Now you can play four games. So the whole idea is, hey, let's get Harbor back, you know, 10th game of the season. He can finish off the season and play the bowl game. So that's that aspect that they're going for there, in my opinion, with the coaching staff. You hope Harbor gets back. But for what Dean has gone through just in his life and, and everything that guy's gone through and having to handle everything kicking wise this year, let's let's be let's not get twisted here. He had the yips last season. I mean. He makes some field goals. They're a seven-win team last year. You know, he didn't have the best season uh, in, in 2023, but, you know, I got to give the kid a lot of credit this year handling every kickoff duty, and we're not we're not seven and one if he doesn't bang in a uh, 52-yard field goal against San Jose State. <laughs> that was clutch. Some uh, updates to the schedule for next year. We got a few schedule announcements. One is that it's going to be a home-and-home home against Oregon State. November 1st, 2025 will be in Corvallis against the Beavers. November 29th will be in Pullman against the Beavers. So two games next season in the regular season against the fellow Pac-12 Beavers. Also another announcement, WC will be traveling to Colorado State, Fort Collins, September 27th, 2025. And then the final one, there was a change of date against Virginia next year. The Cougs will be heading to Virginia October 18th, 2025 to face the Cavaliers, and then the Cavaliers will be heading to Pullman, Washington, September 13, 2031. And as of right now, there's still one opening left on the Cougs schedule. Yeah, and you're wondering what that opening might be. I mean, how great would a Week 0 game be against Miami? Obviously, you're not going to see Cam Ward next year or anything, but you know, my guess is maybe the Cougars are hoping to make a, a last splash with this schedule, but... You know, you're going to have two straight weeks with a, or two games, Ole Miss and Virginia with a bye week sprinkled in between. So that's going to be two back-to-back -back East Coast trips. And, you know, we've kind of seen how the Pac-10, the Traders 10 have done this year. We've obviously mentioned the records and, and so on and so forth. How great would it be if we went, you know, decided to, to cross uh, time zones and get two victories um, or even one, just take care of Virginia. But that old Miss game is going to be something. So, you know, I'm sure uh, the couch Googs will be in attendance in Oxford next year. You can, you can count on it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be a awesome game. Um, so let's get into how the bowl games are going to be selected this year. You sent me a screenshot from uh, an article that you read about how exactly the bowl games will be determined and in specifically with the fellow Pac-12 teams and how they will be selected. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, so uh, John Canzano in his, uh, you know, Monday mailbag came out and, uh, you know, had a couple questions from Coug fans. And essentially, it was actually our boy Wazoo Jogu who uh, asked him the question. He's like, what are the odds of the Cougs getting the Alamo Bowl? Because I don't have the college football playoff in any of my peripherals. It's not there. The blinders are on. So the whole aspect is, can't, what's the best bowl allocation we can get? And the Alamo Bowl is the top bowl. It's the Alamo Bowl, the Holiday Bowl. You have the Sun Bowl, the Independence Bowl, the LA Bowl, and the Las Vegas Bowl. And the biggest money allocation comes from the Alamo Bowl. It's the top spot. And essentially what Kanzano broke down is that uh, an 11 and one team and a 10 and two team could be considered equal. They can draft within one win-loss spot of each other. So if the Cougs are able to rattle off an 11-1 and season and Oregon takes care of business and gets in the college football playoff, right now there's no other Pac-10 schools that can get to 10 wins. So the whole idea is get the Alamo Bowl, face a big-time Big 12 opponent. It's an $8 million purse. That was 2023's purse. Maybe it's a little bit more. The Holiday Bowl gives you the second most money, but – that's $4 million to the Cougs that's going to be split between us and the Beeps. So the other aspect is rooting for the Beeps. We need them to get these to bowl eligibility. They're four and four right now, and their next four games are San Jose State, Air Force, Washington State, and then they finish with Boise State. So 
if you're looking for those two wins, it's likely in their next two opponents with San Jose State, who's benched former quarterback, uh, WSU quarterback Emmett Brown. They've obviously did had they two quarterbacks. Him? Yeah, they did bench him. So they're having some issues themselves in, in San Jose. So we'll see if the Beavs can can get back on the horse. They have a lot of injuries, uh, especially to the defense as well as the offensive line. So you hope they, they can get in track because you need all the all the money you can get. You want both Pac-12 schools to to be you know bowl eligible. Yeah, and I'm I'm always an optimist. So the uh, the college football playoff is still in my vocabulary for now. But at the end of the day, we got to get to 11 wins, uh, both for the primetime selection of the bowl game, and then also for the potential college football playoffs. Now, now uh, going to the college football playoff though, there's like si- like six or seven indicators of okay, hey, your strength of schedule is obviously one. Are you going to play a championship game, which we don't get the luxury of having? How many top 25 wins do you have? Well, we're 0-1 versus top 25, and we don't have any opportunities for another top 25 opponent. So now you're looking at your strength of schedule, and you're going, okay, well, we need to root for Fresno State, UW, <clears throat> um, Texas Tech, San Jose State, and all these other schools that we're playing to to kind of buff that up. But there's just not many opportunities for it, and you're you're really – hoping for mass chaos over the next four weeks in terms of having a lot of big 10 and sec schools with three to four losses. So, you know, you take a look at it, Alabama's got, you know, two losses, but they're still ranked ahead of Boise state right now. Now getting to the social media of the week, uh, we had a few submissions on Instagram. So if you're not already, make sure to follow the couch GM on Instagram, on Twitter, I'll be putting up polls on my story at times. You guys can submit your questions there. If you'd like us to cover something on the next episode. So the first question was, should we expect more close games against mountain West teams? My short answer is I hope not, but realistically, as you already kind of alluded to at New Mexico is going to be the toughest mountain West opponent. The rest of the season, Utah state is our next opponent in Pullman in two weeks. We should be able to throttle them. They're two and six on the year. It's in Pullman. The Cougs do well in Pullman. At New Mexico is coming up right after that. So what's the profile of New Mexico and why might we be a little wary of that? You know, like I said uh, before, you know, Bronco Mendenhall uh, has has been a college football coach for years. Um, They've obviously gotten some wheels turning over there last week. They lost 17-6 to Colorado State, who's one of the better teams in the Mountain West. You know, I think you kind of go when you look at your Mountain West power rankings, you got Boise State, UNLV, and then I, I would probably say Colorado State, as well as Fresno State, you know, and maybe San Jose State in the mix, you know, in that that second tier of teams. And then it's a road game. You know, it's a place you, these guys have never been to. It's a new road trip. And, you know, we've seen how we've have how they've looked on the road. So the whole whole aspect is, hey, can can more games be like the Hawaii game? Right. Where you get up and you distance yourself from that team quickly and, and end up with a, you know, a big time win. The uh, second social media submission was someone asking if we think that the Pac-12 is going to try to get right to 12 teams next season or if they're going to go for eight. I would personally, I would think that they would try to get to eight to start so that they have the flexibility from there on out. They need one more university to join for football. They already have eight for all the Olympic sports with the addition of Gonzaga. So, and who that might be, the current name that we've been talking about is Memphis. That would be awesome. They're doing great this year. Any other names? I'm not sure right now, but Dylan, what are, what are your thoughts? Memphis and Tulane, you know, that's the hope. The hope you can get to nine FBS schools so you can, ha- you know, you're not scheduling a fifth non-conference game. Obviously, if you can get to 10 FBS schools, then you don't have to schedule four non-conference games, just three, you know. So obviously, hey, ideal would be to bring in Memphis and Tulane and <laughs> You know, it's, it sucks because you look at what Barry Odom's done with this UNLV program. They get to play in Allegiant Stadium. There's a lot of perks, you know, especially with the Las Vegas market. And unfortunately, they're just broke, you know. So I, I don't know how binding their agreement is still with the Mountain West Conference. But it, it with and, and with Memphis's, you know, whole position, like it's, it's either shit or get off the pot at, at this point because, you know, there, there's really no better – opportunities come in Memphis's way. I don't see the ACC opening up anytime soon and obviously not the big 12. And when you take a look at what their viewership has been, they've had multiple 
viewership ratings of games under 35,000. And you see a lot of their fans online are just disgruntled and they're, they're tired of it. The, 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 the AACC or sorry, the, uh, the American conference, you know, they just, there's not much you have in terms of not uh, a conference opponents from a basketball standpoint. Memphis is the highest rated Kempom team. There's no quad one opportunities for them in that conference anymore. All those teams are gone. Houston's gone. Cincinnati's gone. At this point, it's like, when is it going to happen? And then I had someone comment on uh, my YouTube post on the graphics showing the final score and the guy sweating his balls off in the corner of a, uh, hey, is this the worst 7-1 and team that has ever been around? Uh, Dylan, y- you saw a TikTok also. What are, what are your uh, comments on that? I, I can see some of the points, obviously. Hey, like we said earlier in the podcast, a couple turnovers away from being five and three, but at the end of the day, this is the schedule that we had. We're not in the PAC 12 anymore. They left. We had to figure it out on the fly. And this is a schedule we're given. And we, we won two of the biggest games that we, we needed on the season in terms of Texas tech and UW, you know, a lot, tough game in Boise, obviously, but it's certainly not the best seven and one team you've ever seen, but it's still a seven and one team that's 22 overall. And the whole aspect of this and how, why it's so big for Washington State is you're remaining relevant from a national standpoint. That's so big for recruiting. It's so big for where the, the team needs to be in the future because you're in the mix. Recruits are seeing it. That AP poll is big time. I mean, being ranked is huge. So they can rattle off four more wins, end this season 11-1, and one, have a big time Alamo Bowl opponent. They'll certainly finish the season ranked, win or loss, if they're 11-1. and one. You have a chance to maybe, you know, finish with a top 15, top 12 ranking at the end of the year. And a lot of momentum going into next year, obviously, with John, John Mateer. The whole hope is that you can save him. Now, hey, we get to an 11-1 record. Now you're like, oh boy, are we going to be able to keep Johnny boy? And we're going to be able to keep Jake, you know? So at the end of the day, we got to live in the moment. We got to, we got to, we got to, you know, appreciate this season for what it is and, and get behind our, 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 our staff and our players. And, you know, Hey, once the off season comes, we'll, we'll deal with that when the time comes. And they are this close from being like four and four on the year, but they're, they're against all odds from like every standpoint, whether it's like no one wants you in the conference. Um, you know, being a small school in the middle of the Palouse, just fighting all odds. And they have a ton of weapons on offense. They've got the potential. It's just a matter of dialing in a few things, getting right for the end of the season and the rest of the stretch and seeing what, what they can do. So the Cougs' next matchup is November 9th uh, versus Utah State in Pullman. Make sure to like and subscribe if you made it this far. Appreciate all of you guys watching and supporting. And be on the lookout for our next recap.